Welcome back to Pet Squares, episode three. First of all, I want to apologize for the long wait between episodes. I have another show called Adam Walks Around, and uh, we just did our 40th episode, and it was very labor intensive. It took us to a lot of uh, film locations associated with the TV show Mystery Science Theater 3000. It took all month to get it up and running, and if you haven't checked it out, if you're at all a fan of the show, Please go check it out. It's really, really cool. Tonight, we're going to be covering album three of the Beach Boys, Surfer Girl. But before that, we've started to upload some pretty cool patron-only content. Uh, I've got a video up uh, of Al Jardine uh, playing with my own band, Adam Marsland's Chaos Band, back in 2005. Also, uh, my band doing uh, Baby Blue, the Beach Boys song from Light Album. And also, uh, I'm going to be doing a bonus mini episode of Pet Squares where I cover some of the uh, outside productions that uh, Brian and the Beach Boys were involved with in the early time period. So if you want to see all that, uh, any level of being a patron will get you access to those videos. We're tr really trying to do a higher level of programming than your average YouTube show, like the Adam Walks Around that we just did. That was six months in the making. So just to be able to keep bringing you a high level of stuff on this channel. Uh, kick in for a couple of bucks a month if you can spare it. If you can't, don't worry, just keep watching, right? All right, let's get started. Uh, before we get into Surfer Girl, we have some, uh, some business to cover from the last episode. You might recall uh, that when we were talking about the Surfing USA album, uh, we were talking about the song Lana. And there was a fellow named John Broad who had given me a, a whole bunch of input on uh, some research he'd done on the tracks from that album, and he claimed that uh, there was a faint uh, accordion in the background during the instrumental break on that song. And I rather dismissively said, uh, no, I think that's Mike Sachs, which we can hear sort of blazing away in the background all through the album. A friend of John's, a guy named Will Carrar, Will, I hope I'm saying your last name right, uh, chimed in and said, not so fast, buddy, there's definitely an accordion on there. Uh, and then uh, Sparks Flew International, emails were sent, people were consulted, and uh, finally I was given uh, a top secret super extraction of the session, and I was proved wrong. There really was something back there that sounded like an accordion, and it was playing in perfect fits with no problem with the transition, so it wasn't a sax. It was an accordion, or was it? Because I started listening a little further, and I said, hey, guys, you're right, it's not a sax, but it's playing a perfect fist. The transitions are almost flawless. If you're a keyboard player or an accordion player, that's a really weird fingering. I'm thinking that this isn't an accordion per se, but something with a, a bunch of push button stops, set, and fifths. You could play over them in a major or minor key. Something like a squeeze box or a toy accordion. And they said, no, I don't think so, because Brian had an accordion when he was a kid, and they sent me a demonstration tape showing that you could physically play it in the accordion. And I said, well, yeah, you could physically possibly do it, but the fingering's really weird, and why would you want to? You're just doing this dumb little, you know. Anyway, the bottom line is, we don't know what it was, but there's some kind of read in the background of Lana. It's, uh, the, I think it was a squeeze box or a toy accordion. They think it was Brian's accordion, but we all agree that it wasn't the sax. So, Mike, with great apologies to you, we are decrediting you on the sax on Lana. You didn't play on it. Sorry, buddy. So, uh, I want to say, because this is going to come up in the show again, that these folks that were giving me this information. They're not just a bunch of books. Uh, they're actually helping uh, Craig Slowinski, who has consulted heavily on this show and is one of the world's leading authorities on who played what on Beach Boys Records. And uh, Will and John and their friend Jocelyn have gone through and listened to these uh, tapes and these extractions over and over and over again. Uh, and they've uh, given Craig a lot of input on, uh, on uh, who played what and who sang what based on their listening. And now that I'm sort of in the loop, uh, I'm not gonna get caught with my pants down again. And before I argue with these guys, I'm gonna make sure I'm hearing what they are hearing, which happened in this episode as well. So we'll continue that fun little debate. Okay, so that's the end of the accordion crap. Now on to the overview of Surfer Girl, the Beach Boys third album. It came out in 1963, the year of our Lord. The date was September 16th. 
Uh, the Wikipedia entry is pretty small. It, uh, we, it does say that Pitchfork, who we all care deeply about, uh, claim it was the 193rd greatest album of the 1960s. If Pitchfork says so, it must be true. This comes out at a really interesting period in the band's history. Now, they've uh, broken through with Surfing USA and then Surf City, which uh, Brian at least was involved with and the whole band was involved with the album around that. Uh, that came out a couple of months later, I think in May, and that went to number one. So the Beach Boys and the whole Southern California cultural phenomenon are, by the summer of 63, in complete full bore. Now, at the same time, uh, the Beach Boys are taking their first steps away from home and hearth. Brian, especially, moves out of the Hawthorne house, finally gets out from under Murray's thumb, uh, moves in, I believe, with Bob Norberg, who uh, we'll talk about who he is in a minute. And uh, Brian, at this point, uh, he's, you know, he's done this rock band thing for about a year, and he's already, through Jan Barry, uh, he's already met the Wrecking Crew guys, and he's starting to get bigger dreams and bigger ambitions. He starts producing outside artists, especially uh, a band called The Honeys, which contains his future wife, Marilyn Wilson, and her sisters, uh, and a, a session singer named Ginger Blake. And uh, he's going to start having sort of uh, ambitions to be a producer. And the Beach Boys are going to be just one of his sort of things he's going to do, right? Uh, now, Murray, of course, not crazy about this, uh, but Brian, for a time, gets a little bit of autonomy because the band uh, starts going on the road. And you think Brian, he left the band. Uh, the, he left the touring band in 65. Au contraire, he did not. He actually first left the band in 63. And this was not widely known in Beach Boys history until the last 10 or 15 years uh, when a lot of people like uh, John Stebbins uh, did a lot of research on the band's early history. And it was discovered that uh, the, uh, the dropout of touring that Brian pulled in 65 had precedence in 1963. Uh, my notes here state that he was already backing out of tours as early as April 63. And who did they bring in to replace him? Well, we have the return of the man, A.J. Al Jardine, who was in at the beginning with the band. He went off to do something that wasn't dental school. And uh, Brian called him back and said, hey, man, we need you to play bass, which you know, in the early days was kind of wild because Al's a sm small guy and bass is pretty big, so he's... He's kind of a little gangly that way, but you know, he can handle the bass pretty well. And Brian is like, yeah, see ya, I'm going home. And Al and Dave Marks are both in the band, in the touring band uh, for much of 1963, while uh, Brian is home doing other stuff that he'd rather do. So this is the situation when the Beach Boys go in to cut Surfer Girl, the song and the single, and also the album Surfer Girl which takes place in the summer of 1963. We don't know the exact dates because most of the session information has been lost, but uh, what's really clear is the band is in transition because now Al Jardine is there, uh, Nick Finney is out, the uh, producer of the first two albums. You have Chuck Britz, Brian's favorite engineer, doing most, although not all, of the sessions, from what I understand. Uh, Murray Wilson producing from the booth, and then Brian in the room with the band producing them. Except now, Brian, who's actually developed quite a bit as a bassist in the last year, he doesn't have to play bass anymore. And so from here on in, Brian's development as a bassist goes because he just doesn't care, I would, I would guess. Um, and, uh, you know, he starts throwing other people on the bass so he can play piano or just direct. Okay, so as usual, in the 60s, the first song on the Surfer Girl album is the title track of the lead single, Surfer Girl. Uh, this is one of the classic Beach Boys songs. It was the first song uh, Brian ever wrote, 61-ish. Uh, it was based, pretty heavily based, frankly, on the melody of When You Wish Upon a Star, which was famously sung by Jiminy Cricket in a Disney film that has slipped my mind at the moment. I'm sure I'll put it up there later. Um, and uh, this was the band's first hit as a ballad, and it did quite well. It went to number seven in the U.S., number uh, 
13 in uh, Britain, but not until 1967. This album was released belatedly after Pet Sounds in uh, the UK. And uh, I think it did rather well. Let me see. I apologize. The album went to number 13 in 1967. The single... I guess didn't do shit. Okay, well anyway. So it's the Beach Boys' first ballad hit, establishes them as a band that can take it down tempo and, and have success, which must have made Brian happy. I believe it's also Brian's first solo lead vocal, although he has, you know, he has really heavy backing from the band. Um, it's a wonderful song, speaking from experience, to sing uh, if you have a bunch of people that can really sing. Uh, it's hell if you don't, because <laughs> uh, it, it's voiced rather low, and uh, so it's very unforgiving if you sing it out of tune. Uh, and this brought me to uh, a very interesting point, because we now have Al Jardine in the band. So the question is, so are we now looking at our first real five-part vocal arrangement? Because uh, Al did sing on Surfing. Uh, but he mostly doubled Dennis or possibly some other guys in the band. Uh, and I was sort of scratching my head about this because I've sung it live a bunch of times and I was never really clear that there was a fifth part and there isn't really a lot of room for there to be a fifth part because it's voiced so low. So I actually did a thing where I wanted to figure out what was going on. So I tracked one verse, just multi-tracked my own voice uh, to sort of analyze what was going on. And by the way, if you ever need Beach Boys vocals on your record, Give me a call. I am your man. So let's go over to uh, hear that and I'll show you what I found out. Okay, so full disclaimer, this is just a quickie thing I did, but here's the Pro Tools file and here's, here's the first verse, right? Little surfer, little one. So far sounds about right, right? something a little missing uh, and so I, I put in uh, one extra note down here right here and now you've got that real thick harmony so I was like wait is it really going from four to five parts you know is it going in and out what's going on here so I contacted the one guy that I trust more than anybody and uh, that would be Darian Sahanaja of uh, the Wonder Mints and Brian Wilson's band and I said hey look I'm you know What's the deal with Surfer Girl? Is it four parts or five parts? Or is it a little of both? And Darian blew me away with his answer because he said he always wondered the same thing. He said that uh, on this song and on I Get Around, it seemed like there was sort of a ghost part that was coming in and out and he could never quite track down what it was doing. And I know the part he's talking about on I Get Around, Dennis sings it. Um, and it kind of comes in on the, on the chorus a little bit. Um, so we sat down with this, and, and, and uh, we definitely could hear right here at the end where they all split off. So to break it down, you've got you've got Brian up here. Brian on a really bad day, of course. You got that. There's Mike. My little surfer girl. That's probably Carl. And then here's the fifth part. My little surfer girl. So anyway, this got even more interesting because uh, I wanted to make sure that uh, I had my transcription right because I just got, you know, I just listened off the internet and banged out the parts and I sent it to Darian. And he said, yeah, it all sounds right except you've got an extra, you got Mike going low uh, here. Uh, and he said, Mike, Mike doesn't do that all undone or all undone. I couldn't tell which. And I said, but I'm pretty sure I hear a low G there, man. And he's like, yeah, but it's a harmonic of the harmonies. It's, a, it's an audio illusion. And he called my attention to the fact that uh, you couldn't hear it on the third verse, which he was right. So, who's right? Me or Darian? <laughs> Darian, most likely, right? But... We can't be 100% sure because is it possible that uh, they added another low part that wasn't part of the original arrangement and then as soon as they went back to singing it at Four Parts Live, they forgot all about it for the rest of history? Yeah, absolutely, because we know we had five guys there. We know Brian was looking for places to stick Al in 
and maybe rearrange a couple spots to make it five parts. So uh, it is possible that I'm hearing actually five parts. And this kind of goes to sort of my general theme with this is that unless you have crystal clear uh, tracks of the original vocal sessions, and sometimes not even then because the guys can sound an awful lot like one another, uh, it's very difficult to be 100% sure about who's singing what at any given time on uh, these records. And so I try to have a little bit of humility about what I do and don't know. I'll, I'll definitely get my back up if I think something's wrong. But, you know, at the end of the day, my motto is I wasn't there. Um, Darian's probably right, but I can't disprove that I'm hearing a low G. So if you guys want, tell me in the comments. Do you hear a low G? <laughs> hear that on the record or no let me know I should go over who's playing what it is actually the classic uh, uh, lineup of Carl and Dave on interlocking guitars Brian on bass Dennis on drums it's a basically a band recording all right next track catch a wave one of the Beach Boys better known tunes although uh, not a hit single uh, if I recall correctly this was on the endless summer um, compilation that came out in 1974 that basically put the band on the map and I think that was about when catch a wave sort of became sort of one of their hits that everybody knew. It also was familiar because it was used by Jan and Dean uh, for their uh, recording of Sidewalk Surfing. They basically made up new lyrics about skateboards instead of surfing and they had a mid-level hit with it. I think in 64, I'd have to check and I'm not gonna. Um, this is one of uh, a couple of songs on this album that has a retroactive Mike Love lyric credit, probably deserved uh, in this case. And this is when we start to see the birth of the true uh, five-part harmony period of the Beach Boys, where uh, Brian would have these integrated arrangements where the lead vocal and the backup vocals, they'd all be part of the same arrangement. Uh, Brian would shift into the falsetto, then he'd fall back into the backing vocals. Mike would do his lead vocal, and he'd fall back down into the bass. And they started to do some uh, really interesting stuff, like this uh, intro, Again, speaking from having sung it a lot, uh, has some really cool, uh, cool parts. Uh, if I remember, like, catch a wave and you're sitting on top of the world or something like that. It's been a while, but they go all over the place. They're really tricky to sing and they're fun if you get them, get them right. Not so fun if you forget them. Um, something that was, uh, that was called to my attention from uh, Craig's research team that I think is pretty cool. Uh, they noted that Dennis appears to be doubling Mike uh, in a couple of spots in the lead vocal. Uh, you can hear him in one channel on Sport Around uh, and uh, in a couple, um, couple other places. It sounds like he's just standing next to Mike and just kind of leaning in and adding it in. I never heard that before. That's pretty great. According to Craig, uh, the band is uh, Al Jardine on bass, David and Carl on guitar, Dennis on drums, uh, Mike Love's sister, Maureen Love, uh, who went on to have a pretty great career as a classical musician, she plays harp in a few places. And those cymbal, uh, those cymbal uh, shh things, that is the first appearance on a Beach Boys record of Hal Blaine, who is widely believed to have played on most of their hits, uh, erroneously. But he did play on a lot of their records, and this is the first time we have him uh, playing on a Beach Boys record record. I don't know. I mean, the song's cool. I do have a little more affection for the Janet Dean version because the backup vocals on that say, bust your buns, bust your buns now. And I don't think the Beach Boys ever got that blue. Um, oh, there's a really super high note um, on the end. Uh, Hit me with me! Yeah, sorry to hurt you that way, but that is uh, never a fun one to sing for me. Okay, moving on. The Surfer Moon. This one's got a pretty checkered history. Now you remember I told you that Brian had a roommate named Bob Norberg. Well Bob was a musician and uh, he sort of became the guinea pig for Brian's uh, production aspirations and uh, Brian did a pretty cool little record for them. It was released in October of 62 under the name Bob and Sherry. I believe Sherry's name was uh, Sherry Oh, I, I, I didn't write it down. Sorry, Sherry, I suck. Uh, but a really cool little record. And so I guess they redid this 
with Bob Norberg, again, plus a woman named Vicki Kocher, and they rewrote the lyrics and called it The Summer Moon. This was recorded at United Studio in May 1963, so a little prior to the Surfer Girl sessions. Uh, Jan Berry was involved. Uh, he did uh, Brian and Bob a solid and wrote up the orchestral charts. Uh, the acetate of the Bob and Vicky version of the song, which was never released, turned up on the Big Beat 1963, a, a copyright uh, mandated micro release that, uh, that came out through Capitol a few years back. Um, and uh, that track, that May 1963 track, was then repurposed for the Surfer Girl album with Brian double tracking himself. So there are no other Beach Boys on this song. Very sort of early 60s, pre-Beatles kind of strings. Uh, Jan was sort of fond of those, as you'll hear from some of their uh, pre-surfing singles, so it's in line with that. Uh, but even though there's no real band involvement on this, this does stand as the first Beach Boy song with a full string orchestra on it. It's also sort of, along with Surfer Girl, the point where Brian starts to be able to really sell a song vocally. He could just melt you by singing a ballad. Uh, this is where he starts to, to really be able to direct and focus his vocals to, to give you that kind of performance. You have Hal Blaine on this track also, uh, although, as I said, this predates his involvement on the prior song, It Wasn't a Beach Boys Session. Uh, also, Ray Pullman, uh, another of the Wrecking Crew on bass, Bob Norberg on guitar, Brian on piano for this song. A cool little song. I love the melody. Now Brian's really doing some good melodies. Okay, next we got South Bay Surfer. A fascinating co-writing credit. It's Brian, Dennis, and Al. But actually, really, Stephen Foster, because the song is Old Folks at Home, a.k.a. Way Down Upon the Swanee River, repurposed with surfing lyrics. You just put some surfing lingo on there, and you can just take any damn song and make it a surf song. I assume that Dennis is responsible for some of the uh, more South Bay pride stuff, and Al probably got a co-writing credit for just suggesting uh, to Brian that they do an old folk tune. Again, not the first time he would do this. Al being the band's resident uh, folk enthusiast. But anyway, this uh, song is all sung in one voice. It's a single track, all the guys around the mic just yelling. Uh, there is some indication David Marks may be singing on this. This is sort of a backwards indication from some stuff we discovered about the song Surfer's Rule. So put a little asterisk on that when we get to Surfer's Rule. There's a great little moment on this song uh, where uh, the drums have a break and Carl on, on the mic just goes, crash. I love it. A little moment of personality from Carl. I don't know if Carl wanted there to be a crash there and nobody would put it there, so he just put his own crash on. Um, some of these lyrics are goofy. Back to old Miam. Back to old Miam, yeah. Uh, musicians on this, Carl playing bass and lead guitar, David doing the rhythm guitar on the basic track, uh, Dennis overdubbing some drums on this, and uh, Mike's giving us the big one. Okay, next, The Rockin' Surfer. Uh, again, uh, Craig has informed me, uh, by the way, I really want to call out Craig uh, on this uh, one because they had just finished analyzing this album and Craig was really passionate about this record and he gave me a ton of information that I am delighted to share with you, so thank you very, very much, Craig. Um, so, um, according to Craig, this is based on a popular Southern California me me melody, melody called The Good Humor Man, which in turn derived from a Czech or Polish folk tune called Stodola Pumpa. Didn't know that. Um, this sounds a little bit more like the previous album. It's got the kind of murky reverb -y vibe. That's not a bad thing. Uh, it's actually got a, a ton of uh, vibe with its pumping organ and its distant fat snare. It's mud, but it's good mud. Uh, apparently, uh, Murray was very excited about how this came out. I'm trying to imagine how that manifested. Al was on bass, Mike was on sax, but they wiped his part, so Mike, you're decredited again. There's some weird ass things that happen two minutes in. There's an unexpected key change and the volume suddenly gets louder. Um, Dave tries to go off the reservation once again and show his lead guitar playing chops, but uh, fails because he's faded out before he can really get rolling. Um, 
there's some indication that uh, when Mike Sachs got wiped, Dennis's drums got wiped as well. Uh, and uh, Craig believes it's most likely Carl Wilson. And one of the things that's come out as we analyze these early records is uh, Carl's quite a musician. Carl is a pretty capable drummer, even from the early days. Uh, and as we see, he's playing bass quite a bit here. Um, he's, and uh, later he'll pick up keyboards as well. So Carl, uh, yeah, very hidden depths with that man in many ways. Moving on, Little Deuce Coop, uh, another uh, big hit of theirs and will become a repurposed title track of their next album, which will follow just one month after this one. Little Deuce Coop is another Roger Christian co-write, a Los Angeles DJ who had a real way with writing lyrics about car cars. Uh, I sung his praises on the last episode. Little Deuce Coop, uh, I think was the, yes, it was the B-side to Surfer Girl. Uh, and it made number 15 as a freestanding B-side. As Mike Lev pointed out, uh, they started to have a strategy around this time that uh, the coastal regions would uh, resonate with the beach and surf culture, and they wanted to start uh, doing content that would resonate with the heartland, with the landlocked states, and so they started consciously getting into uh, car songs, uh, the band all being car enthusiasts, Dennis and Carl in particular. Um, now, there was a, a quote from somebody or other, I forget who it was, but that, uh, that Brian was having a real uh, crisis at this time because he did not know how to tell Dennis that his drums on uh, Little Deuce Coop had been replaced by Hal Blaine. Um, and this is widely believed to be the, the point where Hal starts taking over from Dennis. Once again, this is bullshit. Uh, Dennis played on this track, not Hal Blaine. We don't know what, you know, this may have been uh, referring to some other song at some other time, but Dennis does indeed play on Little Deuce Coop, and there's no indication that Hal played anything at all on it. Um, this was done at the same session as Surfer Girl and Catch a Wave, and uh, each of those songs had a different basis. Surfer Girl, it was uh, Brian, Catch a Wave, it was Al. Uh, on this one, Carl is playing bass, uh, Dave is the only guitar. Another great uh, integrated vocal arrangement uh, where Brian sort of splits off for the main vocals and, and back. Uh, he uh, does a great piano break, Brian does at uh, one minute and one second in. Uh, this song is also in the key of A flat, a rarely used uh, rock and roll key, but you know, it's what they did. Um, another great Roger Christian lyric where you, you just, he just turns technical jargon about cars into poetry. You get pushed out of shape and it's hard to steer when I get rubber in all four gears. I don't give a crap about cars, but I just love Roger Christian's lyrics. Always hydrate when you're doing a YouTube show. Next up, In My Room, wow. Okay, here's a song for the ages. Um, this sort of takes off after the way uh, the Wilson brothers used to harmonize in their bedroom when they were kids. Um, they would sing a song like, uh, I believe, Come Down From Your Ivory Tower. And um, it has the same kind of close harmony that they perfected when they were basically roommates. This uh, was apparently a family affair. Uh, according to Craig, this was all tracked in one sitting uh, Murray's in the booth. There's some question over who's playing bass, but there, there are some indications that it is Brian. And if it is Brian, that suggests that it may have been Audrey, Brian's mom, playing the organ. And in this case, I think this is correct, because I've, the organ on this song has always struck me, even though it works beautifully and I like the part, uh, it always strikes me as being very un-Beach Boys-like. It's a very pre-rock kind of a of a thing, you know. It's not the kind of thing you would expect Brian to do, but it's exactly the kind of thing I would expect your mom to do if you told her to, you know, mom, go play this. And and, and it's it's a lovely idea uh, to think about them all as a family. Murray's in the booth. Maureen, Mike's sister, again, is playing the harp part. Uh, apparently the woodblock is again Hal Blaine, fulfilling a percussion role while Dennis does the actual drums. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gorgeous song. Uh, it's wonderful to sing if you've ever done it. I've, I've sung it many times, including just going on stage uh, when people are 
missing a part and singing it. Uh, I want to say that Mike's part, the low part, is extremely difficult. Uh, I've tried to sing it before. You're holding the tonic, the root note, against all these ascending harmonies in a really low register, and it's really hard to avoid going out of key if you're doing that. So special props to Mike for uh, nailing down the bottom of that one. It's, it's not so hard to harmonize the top parts, but the bass part's a, a bitch. I, I can tell you that for, uh, for real. There's a really nice moment also I want to call your attention to at two minutes and one second in at the end of the song where you get the Wilson brothers all sort of having a moment. Brian's in center channel on the stereo version singing to my room, right? And, you, and Dennis and Carl uh, are harmonizing with each other, but Dennis is loud in one channel and Carl's loud in the other channel. So you, all, you get all three brothers kind of spread out. Each one has their little moment. Just a really gorgeous little spot. Uh, and of course, it's just one of the Beach Boys' most classic songs. And it, it's one of the first Brian songs that gets at something really existential. It's not just talking about a sort of a surface level emotion. I mean, the Lonely Sea sort of hinted at this with its ocean metaphors, but In My Room gets at the essence of introspection and, and feelings of insecurity and safety and having a place that you're rooted. Um, there may have been pop songs that talked about this before uh, 1963, but in, in the rock milieu, I don't know of any. So it's a pretty deep song. Lyric contribution and possibly music contribution from Gary Usher, who was very prominent on the first album. Uh, it's maybe his last song with Brian for a while. I, I could be wrong about that. Also, interestingly, uh, it was once in the book of lists listed as one of the top 10 rock songs about masturbation. Make of that what you will. Okay, surface rule. Okay, we went way down the rabbit hole on this one. This is sung by Dennis, uh, and uh, there, his vocal has a certain sort of distant soaring quality that is a little bit different from the, the, the rest of the vocals on this album. And it's actually really kind of cool because it sort of goes with the graininess of Dennis's vocal style. It's a really kind of a neat vocal. Uh, so uh, Craig and his research team believed when they isolated out the vocals that uh, this was because Dennis was being uh, doubled by somebody else and they theorized because of the lack of uh, anybody else that could have done it, that it was David Marks. Um, I did not think this was likely based on uh, what we know of Dave's abilities and how difficult it is to tightly uh, track a vocal, you know, where you're just doubling somebody that perfectly. So I, learning my lesson for the accordion fiasco, asked to hear what they were hearing. And uh, I did hear what they were talking about, but to my ear, it sounded more like really loud headphone bleed and, uh, and so, in other words, uh, you're hearing Dennis singing a, a vocal, and then you're hearing Dennis's old vocal, just kind of like he's listening to it. Um, so then Alan Boyd chimed in with a solution that uh, really explained what I thought I was hearing, and it was really interesting. He said that the Beach Boys, at this point, were not using headphones. They actually had a monitor in the studio. So when they were double-tracking their vocals, you'd have basically uh, the their prior performance going through a monitor and they'd sing over that. And that perfectly explains what I was hearing. Uh, and what it sounded like was they had done one take that was wiped and there's some evidence of that on the session tapes. And then Dennis uh, sang to that first wiped performance and you hear a tiny little fragment of that on one of the tracks. And then Dennis said, hey guys, I can't hear, can we crank this thing? And so then his monitor got a lot louder, and then you hear quite a bit of his take two in the background of his take three. And if you listen to the discrepancies between the different vocals, you can hear that uh, the vocal singing in the background perfectly matches the vocal in the other channel. Now, I don't know if I convinced uh, Craig and the gang that this is the right answer, but I'm personally, I'm willing to sign off. I think that's what this is. I don't think anybody else is singing behind Dennis. Um, now, but what's really interesting, we're not done with this dumb song, because the song it doesn't really rate this kind of analysis, but here we are. Um, what was really interesting to me about the song is you have some, some pretty tight vocals everywhere else on the album. I could very clearly hear like people doubling up on a part, uh, like two people singing the same part in unison rather than this full kind of harmony thing. And I was more curious actually about why 
that happened. Uh, and so I went back and listened to it, and so did Craig's team, and we both independently figured out that there, even though you can only hear two people, maybe three, at any given time, there's actually five people singing in the background. Just three of them are basically inaudible. In fact, Carl's part, which is the, the third, the part above the two guys loading up, uh, is completely inaudible on the record, and I could, I could only hear it by really, really listening for it on the vocal extraction that I was given. So uh, I started wondering, why do you have five people on the backups, uh, and, and, and the, the balance is so piss poor? So I have two theories about this. Uh, one I don't really believe, but it tickles me, and, and another that I think is probably close to the truth, and they're not mutually exclusive. The one I think is funny is that Dennis was blasting them so much with his monitor that nobody could judge what they were singing or the balance, and that's what they wound up getting because they got a good performance out of Dennis, who gives a crap about the backups. Yeah, maybe, maybe not, I don't know. But um, you had five people there, and you had two people doubling, and what it really does sound like is that they ran out of room around the mic. And so you had two, maybe three people on the mic, and Mike Love being the baritone would have been one of those people to get close because he usually had to be on his own mic because to sing those little parts, you have to be right on the mic. So now you've got three people uh, with Mike probably being further away from the mic than he likes to be because Dennis has got his mic over there, right? And then you've got these two guys doubling up, and then you've got Carl and probably Brian, although whoever's doing the falsetto is not doing a very good job, so that's also a little mysterious, but you can't really hear it, so I guess it's Brian, you know? Um, so, but then why five people? So now we're getting back to Dave Marks again. There's evidence this was cut on the same day as the song South Bay Surfer, which is all the guys singing in unison. They're basically just yelling. So it's conceivable that Dave sang on that, even though you can't really hear him. But if, if, if it's just a gangbang vocal, everyone's just all singing one part, why not have Dave there? So if Dave was already there and Al was there, which he certainly was because he co-wrote South Bay Surfer, or at least he assisted in its theft from Stephen Foster. So now we have a scenario where you've got Al and Dave, and it makes sense that they might double each other because Dave's the weakest singer in the band, and Al's sort of an unknown quantity. So they basically get those two right on the mic. They got to put Mike right on the mic um, to, to because he's singing low. And then Carl and Brian are in the background, and I don't know why they didn't judge the the balance better. But it may just be they just couldn't project enough to overcome the uh, the uh, the Dave marks Al Jardine vocal onslaught. I don't know. That's my theory. It holds up to me. And it is also possible that Dennis was just blasting the crap out of him and they couldn't tell what the hell they were doing. So anyway, that's Surfer's Rule. Um, some other things to cover about the song is if we didn't analyze it enough. Carl Wilson, in an interview in 1973, expressed embarrassment about this song, uh, calling out the four seasons at the end. Um, he said, basically, we were punks. That was our thing at the time, I believe, was his comment. Um, it is kind of fun to hear Brian uh, taking off on Frankie Valley at the end, his uh, falsetto part from Big Girls Don't Cry. And uh, you can really hear the difference in, in their falsetto style, although Brian did get more Frankie-like later in life in his in the sort of 80s period. But at that time, he had a much sweeter and rounder tonality. Uh, according to Craig, uh, there was an interesting thing that happened in the sessions that uh, Brian played bass on the earlier takes of this song, and then Carl took over, and Brian was playing with his thumb, kind of playing quarter notes, and Carl was much more aggressive, according to uh, Craig, in his approach, playing with a pick. So that kind of gives you some ideas to their individual playing styles. Uh, Brian was on piano, Al Jardine apparently in the booth, uh, offering um, advice and telling Murray to syncopate, I guess. Anyway. Next is Hawaii. So Hawaii is another one of these Beach Boys phantom hits like Catch a Wave. It was never released as a single, but people kind of know it. Beach Boys tribute bands do it a lot. Um, this uh, one, a lot of people think Dennis sings this. It's not Dennis, it's Mike, 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 Mike. He just had a cold. His voice is hoarse, like mine's getting from talking for 30 minutes. You know, it's funny, if you listen to Mike on the on the bass vocal, he sounds kind of satanic. 
<laughs> I think because of his cold. So if you're one of those people who think Mike Love is Satan, uh, there's your proof, I guess. Um, I don't particularly hold to that line of thinking, just for the record. Um, but yeah, he sounds pretty, pretty, you know, down there. Um, there was a little bit of controversy between all of us about who was singing what on this. Um, uh, we finally all agreed that it is Al, Dennis, and Carl on the uh, triad. Uh, uh, although there's some question about who's singing what, we all pretty much agree that Dennis is in the middle. It's a really, really low harmony. It's one of the reasons it's kind of hard to tell who's doing what. Uh, but it's really cool, you know, and you got the satanic bass vocal. You, you gotta love that. Al is playing bass, Brian's on very faint piano, uh, then it's the usual team of Carl and Dave on guitars, uh, Dennis on drums. Uh, I believe this is another one where uh, Mike Love got a retroactive lyric credit. Yes, indeed he did. Okay, moving on to our car club. Uh, one of the things I try to do when I do these shows is um, listen for myself in full ignorance of what's there and then ask questions and then get all the background stuff so I can form opinions with my own ears and then sort of find out if I was right or I was wrong. And one of the first things I heard on this is it did not sound like a Beach Boys track. It sounded like the Wrecking Crew. I heard a little snarl in the background that I recognized from a lot of Janet Dean records as being Glenn Campbell's uh, little lick that he liked to do. It sounded like uh, Hal Blaine being pretty heavy on the toms and the verses, not Dennis's thing. And it was indeed a um, Wrecking Crew session. And it was originally a track done for the Honeys, the band I mentioned earlier. It was called rabbit's foot and uh but uh, some of the beach boys do play on it apparently carl and uh, dave at least are on it and dave recollected later that they were really excited because they were getting to play with the great hal blaine and to, so this may be the first or one of the first instances of the beach boys sitting in on a wrecking crew session um, this is sort of a tougher track tougher sounding track than the beach boys did. It's got a little more snarl. It's a really nice uh, baritone uh, sax on that. Uh, Steve Douglas and Jay Migliori doing the horns on this. Um, Carl is playing bass, I guess, uh, which I assume means Dave's on rhythm guitar. Um, and uh, I wonder, because the, the band track on this is really, really, really far back, I wonder if that's partly because uh, it wasn't the band playing on it. I don't know, but the, the band is kind of buried on this. Um, Dennis, very prominent on the backups. This is another one where it sounds like um, they, you've got five guys on there, although I didn't research this one very deeply, to be honest. This has got a nice Mike Bryan sort of ping pong vocal thing going on it. These kids are doing a car club, and uh, even though they're gonna have the, a rough and tough initiation, they're still gonna make sure they've got their sponsor's jackets on, and you know, I don't know, all sounds pretty milk toasty to me, but I never was in a car club, so what do I know? Um, next, uh, your summer dream. This is the first appearance of 12 string guitar on a Beach Boys record, uh, played by Carl. Uh, David Marks plays acoustic guitar on this one. Um, Brian, once again, selling it with a vocal, just a lovely melody. In her eyes, you see a gleam. Yeah, we're back to the cuckoo clock thing where there's something going on on the beach, I'm just telling you. I can tell it was a hard song to play on the guitar, especially with the 12 and the acoustic. There's some uh, clams on bar chords you know, where they're sort of muted notes. The track nearly breaks down uh, at 1 minute 44 seconds when the, the whoever was playing bass, uh, and I think it might have been Brian on this one, uh, I'll check that in a minute, uh, but sort of panics when he hears the, the guitar start to go. So the track nearly goes at that point and then they, they get it back on track. Um, some, very nice bass drum work on the fade out of this song, and you can tell Dennis is really uh, developed as a drummer. And yes, Brian on bass on Your Summer Dream. Uh, this leads us to the final track, Boogie Woody. Instrumental, free pass. Uh, another, another way to just get a track banged out for Capital. Uh, more of that fun, distant organ. I really like the, the sound of this one. Um, Brian is doing both the dueling piano and organ, and it's kind of funny because if you listen carefully, the piano just sort of drops in sort of random places in the bar. In fact, there's one place where it just kind of goes donk. I think it's like 22 seconds in. Al's on bass on this one. Uh, I do want to point out that the rhythm track 
gets kind of ahead of itself. Um, that's uh, Dennis is doing. He gets excited, starts pushing the beat. In the 70s, when he was cutting tracks, he, he became a much more of a deep pocket player. And I've gotten into arguments with people on YouTube about how good of a drummer uh, Dennis was. I tend to think Dennis was a superb drummer at a particular thing, which is making a simple beat sound compelling. Dennis makes a 2-4 sound like the apocalypse. You know, he can just hit, hit a very simple beat, and it, you, but it's a big beat. It's got drama to it. But in the early days, he was your typical teenage kid. He's all full of testosterone. Girls are out there. So he's really, he's really kind of ahead of the beat uh, as a player. In the early days, uh, that would change as he got older, as we all do. So that covers the Surfer Girl album. Um, I do apologize for this being a little more technically oriented and me not having a lot to say about the song sort of from, from a songwriting perspective or an artistic perspective. I did get so much information from Craig and the guys, and, you know, I wanted to put that out there. Uh, overall, I, I would give this album, I guess, a seven. The, the two songs that are basically Brian's solo songs, Your Summer Dream and uh, the, the Surfer Moon, Brian's singing and the melody really sell those songs for me. That They're really, really wonderful in that respect. So th those songs really elevate the album. So I want to remind everybody, if you want to see the bonus episode that I'm going to be cutting very shortly about the Beach Boys Outside stuff, or the Al Jardine performance of the performance of Baby Blue, or any of the other patron-only content I'm going to put up, consider becoming a patron on Patreon or through PayPal. Check the first comment uh, for how to do that. Um, and uh, remember to subscribe. Uh, click the, uh, wait, I got it right this time? Click the logo. Is it here? I always get confused, but there's a Karma Frog logo. Just click on that to subscribe to the channel. I'm Adam Marsland. Thanks for watching Pet Squares, and I'll see you soon for the Little Deuce Coop album.